we are here, the Dev Talk Show on September 23rd of 2020. Thank you for joining us. And as you can see, uh, we've got our, our panel of speakers and guests. So I'm joined as always by my co-hosts, Andy Schwamm, and, and he is here. Rich Ross is here. And, and let's see if we can hear the, the voice from beyond. Are you there, Rich? Let's see if this works. Yep, I'm here. Yep. You guys hear me? Okay. I can, Rich now, is, is it fine? going out on the stream? That's another, another question. Yes, it is going out on the stream. <laughs> okay. And we have uh, our very special guest, um, Shahed Chaudhry, is Hello. here with us to, uh, to talk about a number of things with, with ASP.NET Core and what's coming. And let me tell you, if you haven't gotten to see any of Shahed's talks, we are in for a real treat tonight, I think, Andy. Yeah, it's going to be great. I mean, uh, Shahed is a friend of ours that we, we know him for a long time, at least I, I know I do, uh, from being in and around the .NET community. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm aware of, you know, his popular blogging series and stuff like that. And we've been talking to him, you've been talking to him for a while and saying, hey, we got to get you on the show. This is going to be fun. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're talking about a developer's developer here, in my opinion. He's been to Philly.NET Code Camp. And so, Shahed, welcome to the show. I can't wait to talk to you about your blog series. What have you been up to? Yeah, it's pretty exciting times. And uh, you mentioned Philly.net. I wanted to add a quick note over there. Uh, I remember the first time I was booked to speak at Philly.net. I lived down in Northern Virginia, outside the D.C. area. Uh, so I drove up to Philly. And at that point, I had uh, applied for this job at Microsoft. And uh, while I was still in town, after attending the .NET meetup, uh, I was driving around Philly and I got a call uh, from my new manager at Microsoft saying, hey, would you like to join? I was like, uh, would I? Uh, <laughs> so it was that was a fun time. Like, I think it was good karma to come hang out with you all at uh, in Philly, uh, Philly.net. And then by the time I got back home, you know, I was I went through all the prep and I've been here since. Uh, it's been quite the ride. Uh, I've been uh, working at various roles at Microsoft. But one thing I've always wanted to realize is my passion for .NET. Uh, whether it's working on customer projects or uh, doing some side projects and uh, my blog and open source contributions that I'm doing with some new projects right now. Uh, so, yeah, it's been quite the journey. But one of the things I'd like to say is that just working with .NET, it has been influenced and inspired by so many other technologies out there, competing technologies as well, where you see uh, fresh new features coming on, where someone may look at it and say, hey, I've used this in Python or I've used this in Golang or something else. Uh, so it's great to see the language continue to evolve. Uh, I know a lot of people work with F Sharp and other areas of .NET as well. Uh, I've been primarily working with C Sharp, but it's great to see continuous language improvements and framework improvements too. Yeah, awesome. And I think we'll get, we're going to get to talk about all of that. So I can't wait to just turn this over to you. And, and you've got you know, a really fantastic group of topics to talk about. But let's start with what, what really got me thinking, like I want to talk to Shahed and, and have him on the show, is in 2019, you did a pretty innovative blog series, ASP.NET Core from A to Z. And it was popular. And I think, you know, you can tell us what came of the 2019 series. We're going to hear all about that. But it was so cool that you did it again in 2020. So right now, I just figured, I remember even saying to you, if we came on and just talked about one of those topics, that would be a show. <laughs> because <Yes. laughs> they're all so great. So um, let's let's kind of talk about you know the whole series, and I'll let you take it away. Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen right now. So hopefully you'll be able to see that in the stream as well. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, my blog is at wakeupandcode.com. I'll go ahead and zoom in on that, so you'll grab that really quick. And uh, over time, I've been blogging a lot in ASP.NET Core. Again, whether I had a chance to work on it uh, for a particular work project or not, it's something I wanted to pursue as a side project. And uh, even before the ASP.NET uh, A to Z series, uh, I started off with this uh, mini series at the end of 2018. Uh, this one was quite a surprise even for myself. I wanted to start off with the hello world sort of post where it was a hello ASP.NET core. Uh, around the same time I had attended an event, uh, it was an internal work event with a lot of colleagues working on various customer projects. And I helped a friend of mine at work work on uh, some Azure blob storage uh, going up from a web app in ASP.NET Core. And I figured, yeah, you know, just like we do with throwaway code, you can just write some code and email it to them uh, in a zip file. But I thought, let me make it nicer. I'll write it up as a blog post and I'll put it on GitHub as well. Well, that led to the second post here, as you can see in this 2018 series, 
Yeah. And as I went through each of these different topics, I decided to just tackle different topics that ASP.NET Core developers might find useful. And that turned out to be this surprise Happy New Year post. So the number of weeks ah. <laughs> uh, from October to December was exactly enough to spell out Happy New Year. And uh, it was kind of a surprise uh, that I had planned through this. A lot of people hopefully found it uh, useful. And when I looked up my blog statistics, I'd noticed that went from a couple of hundred hits the entire month to getting uh, tens of thousands of hits. Uh, so it was uh, something that was able to contribute back to the community, but also something that keeps on giving. So when people search for various topics on the internet, uh, they'll end up on my site somehow. I knew I couldn't pull out the same thing twice. I ended up doing this A to Z series, uh, and again, various topics, and I would reveal a new topic uh, every week. Um, one thing I learned from that is every time I worked on a piece of code, it was, again, a piece of throwaway code for each specific uh, uh, topic. But uh, as I started to work on it, I wanted to do this net learner app where I would build an internet learning app where you can share links and watch videos and so on all in one place. Uh, but uh, I didn't really get a chance to build it that much because uh, it started off with one version of ASP.NET. Uh, new versions came out. There was betas and previews. And then 2020 hit where um, after I published this uh, ebook based on the previous series, 2020, I was able to build a single web app. And I got Christian alluded to this earlier, uh, this NetLearner app. It is, uh, yeah. I wrote a special blog post on it, but uh, I just spent the rest of uh, the 26 weeks of 2020 uh, working on the, each of the topics. But again, building out NetLearner live on GitHub. Um, if I go over to the releases section, you'll see there are 26 uh, releases so far again. It's very early right now. Uh, it's something that's building over uh, you know, a lot long time, uh, but it allowed me to uh, put something live out there. It is live right now on netlearner.org. Uh, if I just zoom out really quick, as you can see, I have this little architecture here. I want to describe it really quick and let me know if you have any questions. Uh, going with some of the clean architecture discussions that we have, I know there's no one single way to do everything, uh, but some of the clean architecture books out there in Microsoft Press talk about uh, putting your models and services and core and your database context and migrations under an infrastructure library. Um, I went into a simpler version where I have a shared library uh, to encapsulate all of that. But then I also have separate web apps that can be deployed independently. Uh, in a real life environment, you only deploy one web app, but I wanted to do all three in parallel. So these are all live right now. If I go ahead and click any of those, you'll see a live demo of this. So again, if you're watching the show right now, or if you watch it later on YouTube, uh, you can go to netlearner.org. Again, that web, uh, website is netlearner.org. Uh, if I go over to the MVC site, uh, let's say I want to click on the list. Uh, and let's say I want to jump over to the Blazor site and click on this resource list and click on their uh, the Razor Pages site. Uh, click on the list over here. So what the list does is uh, I have a, a capability of adding a list of uh, different resources. And in this case, I've grouped them into videos and docs you might want to learn about. Uh, for this particular instance, I have ASP.NET topics. Again, whether you want to learn Kubernetes or Ruby or something else, you can create lists for that. Uh, the video feature was something I just added, I think, last week. Uh, again, what this does, it detects whether you have a YouTube video on here. You can click on the link directly, or you can click on watch and watch it directly on the site itself. Uh, use a very simple JavaScript to be able to watch it inline. Uh, if you go into the Blazor version of the app, uh, it's, it uses different code, but again, everything's out there uh, on the uh, Net, NetLearner GitHub repo so that you can go ahead and do this uh, on any platform. Um, so hey, any questions, any comments yeah, on that me, so far? Let me jump in with a question, Chad. Um, the first thing I notice is um, what I was not expecting to see, but I'm seeing it, and I think this is really exciting. This isn't just your content. Um, not that your content isn't great, but I see here Tim Corey. I see things with Daniel Roth. Um, these are other people's, this is other content as well as your own content? Uh, I, yeah, I can explain it. Yes and no. So uh, the content on the blog post itself is all of my content. Uh, yeah. The app that I built as I wrote on each of the topics is all my project. Uh, but since NetLearner allows you to create, think of it as a to-do list app. And in your to-do list, you could say, go to Walmart, go to Target, and so on. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean that it's Walmart or Target's content, but I've chose, uh, I have chose to include their content in the learning resource. So That's the learning resources can be anything you want it to be. Does okay. that make sense? Yep. So build your own curriculum. 
Exactly. And then let's see one right now. So if I go to list right now and I say create new list, right? And I want to see a list of uh, podcasts to watch, right? And then right now uh, I have put a, a sort of login uh, authentication on it so that I don't go ahead and allow anyone to create it on my version. So I'll go ahead and log in. And uh, if I go ahead and create, and it's okay, you can see my email address, but not my password, if I can remember what it is. Hopefully I do remember my password. If I don't, then this is not, obviously this is not oh. gonna work. I'm gonna try a second time. Uh, Always good to I now I don't know I use LastPass I don't know if you if you yes, use something no like no I, I I I'm not using that on there so again this was one of the demo sites I've added some stuff on here but obviously I have not uh, remembered the password for my demo site uh, but uh, what you can do is that if you uh, en enable the red actually you know what let's register a new uh, user right? yeah. oh no I've uh, I've disabled it there too so here uh, so here's what we can do uh, I can go and show the example if I go back to list. And then I have uh, the videos over here. So normally, uh, if you would create a list of videos that you want to see or other links, and if you create a list of podcasts uh, that you would like to see, you can add a link to your podcast, for example. So again, it could be any uh, any uh, learning resource you want to put in. Yeah, that's okay. that's cool. Now, go ahead, now, oh, go ahead Rich. This is Rich. Uh, I know you're going through some of the resources you have there, but there's a question from the chat asking yes. if you actually have a YouTube channel apart from the blogs. Uh, I do have a YouTube channel. It is not active. Uh, it is my uh, username, Shahed C, S-H-A-H-E-D-C. I use the same uh, name as my Twitter handle, but I haven't put any uh, new content on there for a while. Yeah, so my question was, um, if you come to the site and you're not registered, then we're seeing some sample resources and lists. Yes. Do those, if I register, do those carry in, uh, number one, and then number two, if I create and add resources, is it a is it a global view or do the list kind of stay with me? Uh, good question. Uh, so uh, right now, all this is stuff that I've put in. Uh, so since I've disabled the registration, you wouldn't be able to register on this. Uh, but what you can do is go go to the NetLearner uh, source code and just clone it and deploy your own instance. As you can see, there's been you know a bunch of people who have forked this and started as well. Uh, but if you uh, download it yourself, deploy your own instance, uh, and then you'll be able to uh, register and uh, set it up on your, on your own as well. I've also mentioned the intentional restrictions over here where I've disabled registration right now. Um, is that something you'd like to see me go through the steps of uh, enabling the registration so we can do that live on the show? Um, yeah, sure. I guess part of, uh, so, you know, I know that part of this, th there's so many layers to what you've done here. It's, Yes, your blog series, which talked about building this, but then this is like a sample architecture. That's correct. Yeah. So this is uh, so again, NetLearner itself wasn't meant to be a deployed instance when I started the project, but now that it is, and I wanted to show the registration functionality, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, yeah. do what I've uh, suggested here. So again, the, the way it's disabled is that I just have uh, this uh, authorized on the registration page, so you can't even register if you wanted to register, right? So let's go ahead and enable that. So let's say you want to uh, locate your scaffolded identity pages under areas, uh, identity pages account, right? And so what I'll go do is I will go ahead and again, it doesn't matter which one. If I zoom in here, you'll see MVC, Razor Pages and Blazor. Uh, but let's say over here it says areas, identity pages account, right? So I want to go to areas, identity pages account, right? Uh, and then the instructions say, in registered as CSHTML, update the tag to include environments in addition to development if you want. So what does that mean? If I go to register here, and again, over here it says in the development environment, uh, show things like create new account and so on. Uh, and then the third thing here it says, and I'm going to read it out loud, register.html.cs, that's code behind for the registration page, uh, replace authorized with a lot anonymous. So it's simple as allowing you to register right away. Uh, so I'll go ahead and run this locally, so I won't be deploying it right now. So sure. notice I have this commented out, oh, yeah. and I can just go ahead and do that. So what that allows me to do is actually run this right now, and this will connect to my local instance, so we can do a complete demo with this. 
That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's and, cool. And this is uh, the repo. I mean, I'm sorry. The project solution that you're showing right now is pretty much what I will see when I bring down your repository. That's correct. It is exactly the same thing. Cool. I haven't, uh, I, I haven't, uh, you know, checked in my secrets. Uh, the version that's on the internet, uh, I use uh, Key Vault, which is under K for Key Vault. Uh, and uh, <laughs> if you use the app service, you can also store environment variables. Uh, so that allows you to uh, commit your source code. So as uh, some of us may have done in our past, or uh, maybe we know a colleague or friend who has done this, where you accidentally check in your secrets and database keys and other API key, which is big no-no. You should never check it, not even once. Uh, so uh, what, what I've explained in the blog series uh, is that there are ways to secure your secrets, uh, user secrets at your development machine, and also application secrets uh, once you have deployed, uh, let's say, to Azure or some other cloud provider. Uh, I cover Azure primarily. It's what, that's what I know best. Uh, you're able to go ahead and uh, log in. Uh, to a database without having to support supply your database credentials. Uh, so as I was talking right now, I'm going to show this little IS icon at the bottom. Uh, it's running my application locally. I'll take a few seconds. I have the debugger turned on. Could yeah. have also run it without debugging. That would have been faster. Yeah. Uh, what this will allow us to do is uh, connect to the local database instance, and uh, we'll be able to complete a registration. And then. Uh, we can go ahead and add a couple of items there. Uh, still waiting for locals host there, so I'll give that a couple of seconds. Uh, any yeah. questions so far? Yeah, well, so we've got some okay. chat going on in the in yes. the chat room. Saduki's here. She said hey, and uh, and uh, contrived X says he's never heard of anyone checking in uh, a secret into source control. Now, I think he's done it a few times. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure we've all done that. Uh, but we have some kidding around going on here. Uh, Saduki said it was a nice way to track learning resources, so we're hearing some nice feedback on your on your uh, stuff right off the bat. We haven't really even gotten too far into it, but I think it's pretty obvious it's a good yeah. way to, to track resources. You know, I'm, I'm just curious, I'm jumping back a little bit towards the blog post series while we're waiting for this to fire up, but yes. I'm guessing that as a blogger, and I know you're a knowledgeable person, and I, I'm not questioning your knowledge on any of these topics, but I'm willing to bet that in doing a, a series as broad as this and as, as big as this, you probably learn a ton of stuff yourself just writing these things. Is that is that the case? Uh, that is the case. Uh, so one thing I wanted to highlight here, if you can still see my shared screen, oh, okay. uh, things probably I, I blame I'll blame Skype on it. So I'm running Skype and Visual Studio and PowerPoint and this IS Express. So uh, the loading yeah. symbols is going, so it's going to take its time. Oh. Uh, but to answer your question. Uh, it's I, I don't uh, remember anything, so I blog, so I can go back to my own blog post and copy and paste my own code. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> every place that I go to to learn, I make sure that I have a references section that's jam packed with everything that's there. Uh, something as simple as creating file new project where it magically just creates things for you. Uh, when you add something with scaffolding to your project, uh, again, it does things magically for you. Uh, what I try to do in the blog post is explain those uh, things line by line. So uh, it's my own understanding of what I'm learning along the way and the references for uh, wherever I'm getting it from. Yeah, so um, I mean, we can walk through a blog post if there's one to, to show what you're talking about there where you, you it sounds like you really like take a step-by-step -step approach, which I appreciate because um, there's so much to cram into learning content, whether it's a video, a blog post, a presentation, that sometimes I've gone to see something, I've watched something, and then I come home and I sit down to try and use it myself, and I actually get stuck on step zero, the stuff <laughs> before the blog post. Yes, so that's a good question. Uh, I, the, I brought up my Key Vault uh, blog post over okay. here. So here you can see how you could access your Key Vault resources uh, from your local system as well. Uh, using your identity from Visual Studio, uh, or you can uh, view it, uh, use it directly in Azure uh, from your app service. So again, uh, different app, uh, cloud providers might have their own version of this. In Azure, there's something called Key Vault to store those secrets. And uh, the way I uh, set it up here is explaining how you would set it up, uh, and again, through the portal, through Visual Studio, and so on. And at the very top, I have this little table of contents there that explains oh, wow. setting it up, retrieving it, and so on. And then again, following with the references section, because it's really hard to, uh, again, remember everything. And sometimes uh, you don't want to repeat the information. I explained the information as to like what's coming out of uh, the different news from Microsoft. 
Uh, but again, I point to the source. And while we're talking, I noticed that the title bar has come up. Uh, for right. home page. So this is a local All version. Right. Again, took a long time. Visual Studio, I clicked debugging and set up start with that debugging. I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit. You'll notice that registration logins right there. Let's go ahead and register a new user. Uh, I don't have any blocks on the registration. So if I enable that in my live version, uh, it would let anyone register. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and use my uh, Gmail account, um, see if that works. And uh... thanks, Saduki. She posted in the uh, the URL to All this. Right. And you have uh, Santosh is here and uh, saying hi, by the All way. All right. Hi, Santosh. <laughs> Ancient coders here. A lot of people are here today. It's good to see everybody. Very cool. We're building a family here on, uh, on the right, DevTalk that. show. Look so it's asking this. me here whether I want to confirm my account or not. It's, again, accessing the local database. I apologize for the slowness out of everything running on my machine. But now that I registered, I can go ahead and log in over here. And I will use that email I have locally. So again, you won't be able to do this on the live site itself. But if you clone the repo, you can do it locally. So I'll go ahead and use my magic password. Uh, oh, no. Did I mess up again? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> yeah, and you know, that's no. Um, okay, so I've said this before to people that um, sometimes when you're when you're talking and thinking and presenting and <laughs> working all at once. Yes. It's a lot to juggle, even though you make it look so easy, right? Yeah, it's a lot and, and the juggle. funny thing is that uh, I, cr I literally created this path. I typed it correctly twice during the registration process, and then I typed it wrong two times during uh, sign in. And I do this a lot, like uh, when I click shift for a new uh, one of the uh, uppercase keys, and I accidentally like type two uppercase keys. So anyway, I'm logged in. That's why I make says, my passwords all password <laughs> one. <laughs> Don't there tell anybody because it's just amongst <laughs> friends here, but I make it something I can never forget, and that works pretty well. All right, all right. Well, but we I don't learned... check it in, but I don't check it in a code. Yes. So <laughs> I, you know, so that's cool. <laughs> but now we know, right? So we learned a couple of lessons today on the live site. Uh, one thing I wanted to do was log in as an existing user because the registration is blocked uh, in the source code itself. Uh, I wasn't able to log in because I didn't remember what my password was for any of the demo accounts. Uh, I can reset that manually, but again, uh, you know, I didn't want to do that live. Yeah, that's okay. And the second part is I'm running locally, and again, uh, I have a couple of local users too. It's a different database, uh, but as you can see, I'm able to uh, see the list of videos. And when I clicked on the uh, list of videos here, I see a, a bunch of different videos here, and those that are detected to be YouTube videos, uh, it shows me a little uh, pop up here: Tooltips, YouTube, blah blah blah. Again, I can click on uh, watch, and here's the thing. Uh, sometimes you're able to uh, load a video or embed a video from YouTube, but if they have prevented you from playing embedded videos, uh, it'll load it. And then once you try to play it, it'll tell you uh, you can't play it embedded, but you can go to the site and it'll give you a link to go there as well. So again, not completely blocked out, but YouTube makes it a friendly experience if you try to embed a video uh, on a third party site that they don't want, that the owner doesn't want you to. So now that we're here, let's go and create a new list and let's say, uh, we want to create a list of uh, video podcasts, right? New video podcast, click create. And then I want to go into the list and I can see all the details from it. Uh, and it doesn't have anything here yet, right? So I'm going to create a new learning resource. And uh, do you guys have a short URL for your YouTube channel or should I just go and search for it? Or we could do the Dev Talk Show, right? Dev yeah. Talk Show. Is it the Dev Talk Show? Yep, that works. Okay. And I want to select new video podcast. And this is for the RSS feed that's optional. And I click on that. And if it knows that uh, that it's not, you know, one of those, uh, I can see a link down there. So if I go to that link, it'll take me to the site. Oh, and it came through. Exactly. <laughs> the site came through. So I just clicked back. But what if you want to see just new video podcasts? So I clicked on the just the link itself for the list, right. and you can see one list over there. And uh, what's your favorite uh, developer site for uh, documentation for .NET? Oh, I mean, should we should we say docs.microsoft.com, <laughs> or should oh, we say wakeupandcode.com? Code. <laughs> docs is good. We'll add it to that list. 
And uh, now it says video podcast, right? So now I have like multiple things in the same list. I'm scrolling down and I want to go ahead and edit this video podcast. Right? How do I get to it? I click on list on the very top and then I want to edit the video podcast and say, um, I have this uh, breakpoint over here. So I'm going to go undo that breakpoint. Let's disable all breakpoints. And click continue. And uh, I'll just say and stuff. All right. And now I can create look uh, click on that list itself and I see just those two items, but I don't have any YouTube videos on here. So let's go to I click control uh, click on the dev talk show link. So while that site is loading the dev talk show, I want to grab uh, one of your uh, recent videos. So let's go to that uh, laser talk. I wonder if I can right click here, copy link. Let's see what that gives us. Because uh, sometimes YouTube has various links that they have. If yeah. I go under uh, resources and I want to create a new learning resource, I can choose it from here or I could go directly from the item as well. So right now, this looks like a proper YouTube link, right? Some video. And I want to add it to that podcast, click create. And this is something that you can do right away. And again, it throws you back onto the list of links. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, this is something that I built over time while working on the blog series. Uh, there are a lot of improvements that can happen around here. Like if you create a, a new video uh, or some resource link, it should, uh, in, instead of dropping you to the giant list of links, it will be nicer if it dropped you to the list you're already working with. But if I click on new video podcasts and stuff, you'll notice that it recognizes that as a YouTube video and you can watch that live right here. So it's a blazer talk with Carl Franklin. Uh, I can hit X on it and so on. So again, that's a very quick uh, demo. Uh, it's a very much a CRUD app, uh, but behind the scenes, everything you would need for your A to Z of ASP.NET, uh, you can find it uh, in the block series and you can go through each of the releases uh, and uh, discover more about the source code. So what kind of interesting, um, you know, when you when you built the, this, it's a lot of it is from your blog post, right? Like you, you blog blog posts are about building the app as well, right? Or you use That's it? That's correct, yes. Uh, so, so it, it goes hand in hand. What kind of hand. interesting technology do you have, you know, sort of baked into there? Uh, so I guess it depends on what you consider uh, interesting. So, so <laughs> for someone who's uh, just brand new to ASP.NET Core, you might find like SignalR maybe exciting with uh, you know, real-time features. If you've been working on it for a while for your work and you don't have any opportunities to do real time, again, you might not find that as fun. Uh, worker service was something I found uh, interesting. And the cool thing is this is very meta because uh, if you look at the block series, uh, a worker service, when it was first introduced, it's a way of creating uh, either a Windows service that runs in Windows or some sort of Linux, Linux daemon uh, and Linux-based services because .NET Core is cross-platform. And I didn't know how to work that in into uh, my block series for ASP.NET Core. So what I did was my worker service sample code uh, is one of my experimental uh, tools that helps you build uh, a new uh, a, a new ebook from scratch. So what it does is uh, here I go through how to create a worker service and the sample for it. I'm going to go ahead, go to my Windows Explorer, go to the experimental folder, and I will launch another Visual Studio. And I'll go ahead and kill the other one right now. Launch Auto resources here. And then you'll see there's something called Doc Maker there. Read that out loud in case that's too small to see. And I'll zoom in as soon as I get the code open. So here I have docmaker.solution. So what that essentially does, it goes to a site, grabs the HTML content. Again, which seems super easy until you actually do it to try and build an ebook. Uh, yeah. So what it does here is that the code. It goes, grabs the content, it skips all the banner text and then the navigation header. Because uh, if a site is using uh, some sort of, in, in my case, I use WordPress, but if you use any blogging platform, chances are you'll have a div uh, in your HTML code, uh, which identifies your main content. So I grabbed that. And the main problems I had with the doc maker is that once I started creating chapters, uh, the different uh, text elements uh, were formatted differently. Because as you know, a website can go on forever, but a Word document has fixed width and fixed height based on the page size you select. Uh, so here's all the different Word documents that get generated. This is how I create my own ebook by using one of the samples from my ebook. Uh, so again, it wouldn't exist without itself. Uh, so while uh, Visual Studio is loading, what I'll do is I will go up here in the web browser. I'll stop scrolling here so it doesn't look too blurry for you. And then if I go to uh, this particular release, uh, version 23, 
Again, the latest version obviously has all the code, but this particular version, uh, if you go under uh, compare and let's compare it to 22 and see what I added. And that's another reason why I chose to do it in these 26 releases so you can see exactly what was added. Uh, this is just a project info. Uh, this is the program, again, super simple, just uh, creates this hosted service, add hosted service with this worker service. And if I go further down, this is the doc engine. Uh, this code over here just says, hey, grab my HTML, uh, and I'm using a third-party uh, library as well to do some of the formatting, uh, and I'm able to spit it out into this Word document. Uh, and then finally, uh, if I have to fix, I, I do this manually, I have the private method here, this fixed quote formatting, again, through trial and error. Uh, there's some problems with new lines that I had to redo a couple of times, and basically replace it with a specific fixed width format that I wanted. So I'll zoom in on that a little bit over here. Wow. All right. Uh, so hopefully that'll be, uh, so this, this small method here is the only part I had to do uh, through trial and error. But what it finally does is uh, it also tries to fix the images. So as you know, on the web, images have no bounds, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In a document, I want it to be consistent and have everything be width, uh, width size. Uh, I tried a lot of this trial and error here. Is If this doesn't make sense, it's because, again, it was trial and error and trying to remove things that I didn't want in the image. Uh, but also, I, I was trying to fix the image width. Oh, this yeah. was very hard to do. This did not work. Uh, so you'll be surprised how I finally ended up to get, uh, to get it to work. So here's the code right now. Uh, if I open this up a little bit, I have this uh, string of uh, uh, st string array over here, all the article URLs. I've uncommented just this one line so that it wouldn't take all day to create this. And I'm going to okay. go ahead and do debug and then start with that debugging. So again, this is W for worker service. Uh, it generates a Word document based on the blog post. So again, it says processing one uh, docs uh, at uh, this time right now. It's making the doc, it goes through the source, grabs the content live. So if someone were to, if my site were down right now, obviously it wouldn't find it. Uh, but it's making that document and uh, now it's done, right? It outputs this particular format. And then I can go ahead and close that. And if I go back to the main folder, it just dumps it in the main folder. Um, I have this brand new file that was created and you'll see a couple of things that were wrong with it. Uh, one is that, the, again, the images uh, will not work very well. Uh, and but then the code should be fine. Uh, so the code I had to do it a couple of times just to get it to work. So let's see if that comes up. So you see here the top banner image looks really small. If I go further down, uh, this image looks okay, but then the caption that's right after it uh, worked great on the web, but here just sort of uh, moving on to the side here. Uh, so what I did was, believe it or not, added a VB macro here to the page. <laughs> a lot of different languages didn't play. And here's what it looks like. Uh, let's go into. I mean, this is a tough problem to solve, right? I mean, I, I've yes. dealt with some of this stuff a little bit myself, not to this extent, but um, th this is this is a pain in the neck. Like, it is, yeah. And it does like literally one line. Go through all the inline shapes again. Uh, the, the way to figure this out was just to go do some Google foo and find out what might work, what other people have tried. And uh, I, I use my own width size over here. Four sixty eight seemed to be okay. I tried scale height and scale width as well. If I zoom in over here, this is what this code looks like. But this one line over here that says, take all the inline shapes, reduce the width. And then uh, as you can see over here, this banner is now nice and wide and so are all the images. And uh, the code formatting was done in the C-sharp code. So over here, anything that's command line, I'll zoom in on that, that as well. Uh, the command line stuff or code snippets that are further down over here. We'll stop scrolling so you can see better. So all these are, again, fixed width format. Uh, so this now that this, this is done, uh, making it to, into a PDF, you can do command line as well. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that I combine all the Word documents together. Uh, Word has a cool feature that lets you just select uh, different. Uh, let me go ahead and click home here to show you. If you click on insert in Word, and again, this is not programmatic. Uh, you, this is kind of hidden over here. But if you go ahead and click this text from file, you can select all 26 documents and make a single Word document. So that part's still manual. Uh, I didn't think it would add to the blogging experience on C-sharp uh, to uh, automate that. Uh, but uh, I figured the first part of using that worker service to generate that ebook uh, was worth uh, time. Yeah, so we um, we have a question that, was, that said, uh, worker service is a new feature in ASP.NET Core 3.1. I think it's a touch older, but why don't we 
talk about what a worker service is, it it may be unfamiliar to folks who have a legacy. You know, they've spent. I well, I hated. I didn't mean to use the word legacy. <laughs> who uh, who grew up with ASP.NET four or earlier, like myself. Uh, sure. Uh, so that's what, so, um, what I'm wondering. There well, it is. A, a worker service. It's kind of uh, it's was originally introduced as uh, one of the templates under ASP.NET. It has since been moved out. Uh, I still wanted to keep it in my uh, .NET series, again, because it's something useful for people to know. Uh, I did put a note in there saying, is a meta project that generates Word documents, blah, blah, blah. It's in the experimental folder. Again, it's not part of the main uh, net learner code itself. Uh, but th if you can think about how you have background processes running, if you go to your task manager, you'll see not only visible applications, but things that are running in the background. Uh, if you want to run something that's just sort of sitting there listening or a long running process on a machine, uh, you can run that. Uh, in the back in the day, you would have to create a Windows service to do so. But now with .NET Core being cross-platform, again, the same code can run on both Linux and Windows. Uh, there is one trick that I wanted to show you. Uh, if I go to the doc maker code. Yeah, I think this is a real key too because in in ASP.NET, uh, we spent so much time trying to come up with inventive ways to run something that was like a background service or a worker service that might do more than just request response. And right, now right. we have built into .NET Core, we have something that's that's designed to be a long running uh, a long running service on top of a host, whether that's a website or otherwise. Yep. Uh, so what I was looking for is, uh, I forget the syntax for it, but there is a way to specify that you want it to run as a Windows service. For this particular one, uh, I wasn't uh, running it as a Windows service. Uh, but the cool thing about the cross-platform code is that if you choose to run it uh, as a Windows service, you can. And if the same code runs on Linux, uh, it's, not going to, it's not going to mess up your code. Actually, I did find it. There you go. Uh, so it is right oh, here. Oh, I see. Yeah, so that's defining the host. Yeah, exactly. Right. So you can define right. the host and you can run it uh, as, uh, uh, using Windows service on your Windows box, but with the same code on untouched running on Linux, which I haven't tried personally, but you can grab the code to run on Linux as well. Uh, it should just run uh, without doing anything, sort of like a no op. That is pretty cool. Yeah. And as you can see, the, uh, this code here is super small. Uh, the configure logging again optional, but uh, once you add your hosted service worker here is this class. Once you define it, it can contain anything you want as long as it implements background service. And let's see what background service looks like. Let go over there and go to definition. Uh, background service again has a start and stop and execute. Execute is where the magic happens. Uh, and as, as long as you've implemented this worker service, uh, if I do minimize some of this stuff. You can see uh, I didn't choose to override start or stop in this case. I just have to execute async and you can put whatever you want in it. And that essentially is your worker service. Super easy. That is nice. And you know, so what I love about this is you made the choice to implement NetLearner. Uh, it, there's some shared code, what we might call, and then there's an API. Um, so there's code, that, there's some code reuse, good examples of code reuse. So somebody who is maybe learning ASP.NET uh, Core gets to see a real live example, a working example, not just a tutorial right. of, of shared code. But you made the further choice to say, I'm going to implement it in all three of ASP.NET Core's front end frameworks, uh, MVC, Razor Pages, and Blazor. So I want to know why. I want, in your word, why did you make that choice? And, yeah, good uh, question. And what do you think the value is for, for all of us there? Uh, so I think uh, I didn't know where to start, where to go with it. Like last year when I was doing even the A to Z topics, I thought it was going to do anything.net where K could be connect and H could be HoloLens. And that was like a never ending rabbit hole that I could not get out of if I chose to do every topic ever made. So M would be machine learning. So when I decided, as I uh, when I, I didn't even decide all the topics when I started the series, I do have to thank uh, John Galloway from the .NET team. Uh, he used to work under Scott Hanselman. Now he's uh, on the Mac Visual Studio Mac team. Uh, so John Galloway uh, reviewed my topics very early on, 
and uh, we went back and forth on like what might work, uh, what's coming up, what I should talk about, and so on. Uh, and I realized that you know if I just narrow it down to ASP.NET Core topics, that would work really well, and that's what allowed me to do the code snippets where some of them were shared, but most of them were unrelated. And then I wanted to do something different this year, and uh, NetLearner was something that I'd already come up with with uh, with ASP.NET Core 2. Point something before that, but for 3.1, I wanted to build it out. So I built it from scratch, and uh, I wasn't sure how to pick between MVC, Razor, Pages, and Blazor, uh, because I keep hearing that there's lots of folks working on enterprise projects that are still running MVC. Uh, when you click File New Project, you're uh, really tempted to start with Razor Pages, which works great for simplifying everything, but I find MVC a lot easier to explain if you want to see all the parts separately, and Blazor being the cool new thing that just came out, it would be a shame to leave that out. Uh, so I realized I just couldn't leave anything out. So every week I made sure that all of it was fully functional, and that kind of forced me uh, to keep myself honest, uh, always have a working version. So if I didn't have those working releases, uh, then you know it would break the entire series. I had to stay true to the series for 26 weeks in a row. Wow, yeah. it's a lot of effort, right? API. Sorry, Chris. I noticed you have an, uh, one of the projects is called API. So yes. does everything, uh, regardless of which UI you're using, does everything flow through that common API? Is that the way it's designed? Uh, so the API, this is not done yet. Uh, so if you okay. look back at the, so uh, yeah, I'm glad you spotted that. So you look back over here, having a web API would allow other things to use it uh, over mm -hmm. here is open-ended thing, or maybe a J JavaScript front-end web app. Uh, I didn't finish that part here for the series, uh, but again, it's just sitting there as uh, an open-ended thing that I could build on later. Uh, when .NET 5.0 comes up, uh, I could possibly upgrade uh, .NET Core 3.1 to .NET 5, but I would have to change some other things as well uh, to make sure they're taking advantage of what's new in .NET 5. Um, so a lot of it is just up the inner plumbing. Most of the code is uh, still continuing to work, but again, there will be some work involved. Uh, so if I continue to uh, update the project uh, next year as well. Uh, I would. Uh, I, I do have a lot of projects in mind, which you'll see shortly. Uh, but if I do continue to update this, uh, I would definitely have to expose that API so that others can use it. I love that you mentioned .NET 5, and it sounds to me like maybe we should talk about .NET 5. We should talk about .NET 5. Wouldn't hurt, yeah. right? The timing is okay. All right. <laughs> uh, so I think .NET Wait, 5 is- Before you talk about .NET 5? It is best explained in this visual over here as far as release is concerned, because back in the day, you would see releases all over the place. Um, but right now, you'll see that since 2019, the yearly releases have been every November. Uh, every November 2020 is .NET 5 GA. Well, most important thing here is to recognize that the LTS or long-term support releases are every other year, right? Uh, so from going forward, it's going to be on the even numbers. But again, .NET 5 will be a major release, and that's when everything will be brought together. Uh, so I don't have the uh, the diagram for it open here, uh, or maybe I do on the roadmap. No, I don't have the roadmap open here. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the things that uh, is explained in .NET 5 is uh, the combination of everything under every platform. So again, uh, the .NET, uh, .NET 3 had first supported desktop application as well. So .NET Framework developers working with desktop could now start uh, working with .NET Core. And again, going forward, there'll be one single .NET 5 that combines all flavors of .NET into a single one. Uh, it does say .NET standard here in the original uh, uh, diagram here, but just to let uh, the viewers know, uh, one of the newer announcements, uh, I think just in the past week or this month, uh, was that uh, .NET standard going forward, uh, what, like if you're focusing on uh, targeting something, uh, that's cross-platform. Uh, you can target .NET 5 as the uh, as the target framework for your libraries or your projects. Uh, so instead of having all these different flavors and different .NET standards being supported by different .NET frameworks, uh, there'll be one .NET 5 going forward. Uh, I think it's a little uh, too much to go to in this call, but I would suggest looking up uh, the new .NET standard uh, announcements uh, from Microsoft. Right. Right. Um, so let's 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 maybe ask you, I want you to, to tell us, since there's going to be so much for us to go into with .NET 5. I mean, yeah. we saw just this week was Ignite, and Scott Hunter has a wonderful presentation on, on the future and how .NET 5 is, is really carrying that future for .NET. So, you know, everybody here, 
uh, make sure you get out and check that session out as it's hitting uh, on demand. So, you know, what are your favorite parts of .NET 5? And, and let's talk about what you're really looking forward to. Sure. Uh, so when I talk about .NET 5, I look at it in terms of uh, C Sharp features. So uh, when I worked with .NET, I primarily worked with C Sharp. Uh, so uh, over here, you see a lot of the C Sharp 9.0 features, which have been out in the wild for a while, going through various previews. A uh, couple of things that interest me happen to be at uh, towards the top of this list. So this is very easy to go through. Uh, record types is something that I find very useful. Uh, and again, uh, the best way to describe it, I'll just read this off of here. Uh, so if you're using uh, record types in C Sharp 9, uh, think about creating immutable references. Uh, usually when you hear the term immutable, uh, it uh, comes up in the definition of how strings are defined. If you ever learn how to create a C Sharp string, uh, you learn about how you shouldn't be appending strings to another string, you use a string builder object. And then once you're ready to create that string, you can convert that uh, built up string builder into a string because again strings are immutable. Uh, they're not uh, they're uh, not typically appended. They're destroyed every time to create a new version. Uh, so the way uh, uh, these properties work uh, for a record is that you can create a copy and modify it at the same time. So if I scroll down a little bit over here, uh, it talks about uh, some of the different points over here. I wanted to highlight two things here. Uh, one is that. Uh, these records uh, support uh, copy construction. So let's say you create something, you create a copy of it, you can modify it as you're copying it, which is mentioned over here. Records can be copied, copied uh, with modification. Uh, so again, a different way of looking at how you create your structures and classes. Uh, and again, if you want, don't want any further derivation from it, you can use the sealed keyword, uh, again, uh, to make sure that the record uh, stays uh, as is without being derived further. Uh, so find that useful. Again, there's a lot of different uh, uh, different uh, uh, features that are coming up with C Sharp 9. Another thing that I'm looking at is these top level statements uh, where you're able to very shorten your uh, C Sharp program to make it super small. So as you can see the same program over here. Uh, this code here says that it's doing a quick hello world within a main method. And for a lot of new programmers, they just want to print something to the screen. Uh, if you remember, uh, for those of you who do remember, back in the Visual Basic days, you could just print something to the screen very quickly, and a lot of programming languages have that. You don't have to do all this ceremonious stuff around classes, the namespace, and some main method. Uh, so the simplification of this is that behind the scenes, it's still running the same code, but uh, you could shorten it how you write the code. So in this case, instead of creating all, uh, all that with the start program, uh, you can uh, start off with just using system and uh, console the right line, or if you want to just write in one line, you could do this. This is a fully functional C sharp code with C sharp nine running on .NET five. Yeah, so there are a lot of cool features. I mean, like record types are something folks are looking for to have the truly immutable. Um, I don't want to call them structures because that would be structures. <laughs> Those right. would be structs, <laughs> but the truly immutable data structures that uh, that we don't we didn't quite have before. And you know, I actually saw um, I saw David Fowler. Uh, who works on the on the ASP.NET team talking about how I, I don't know that he was surprised by how top level statements allowed him to write microservices with not a lot of ceremony. Yep. You know, it's like I got a small program and I just want it to work, right? This is great for teaching as well. So let's say right now I have uh, this doc maker that has all this other stuff around it to create a worker service. But if you imagine uh, starting off with very small examples where it does everything you need to, uh, whether you're using C Sharp notebooks, which are which came from the world of Jupyter notebooks, where Python developers have used Jupyter notebooks in the past, uh, C Sharp is now supported in Jupyter notebooks. Uh, you can combine that with C Sharp nine and top level programs as well uh, to create a learning curriculum for new developers as well. Yeah, so we got a question, um, and I'm going to try. You know, there's a lot. Of, this is what I love. There's a lot of ways to go. The username could be. Mr. Credi Six, or maybe MRK Ready Six, but in any case, thank you for joining us. And the question is really good. It's can we expect a .NET Core three plus, or uh, has it died with .NET five? Which will continue, .NET Core or .NET Standard, or both are different? Uh, so right now, uh, in the roadmap, uh, anyone who's using .NET Core three point one, uh, your path forward would be to upgrade to .NET five when it's available. You don't have to do it right away. Three one is a long-term release, uh, so it's an LTS support release, so it will continue to be supported. 
Uh, but if you, uh, when, when you do uh, get time, I would suggest making time to upgrade to .NET 5 when it comes down so you can take advantage of at least the performance improvements that come along with it. Right. One way I like to think of .NET 5 is that um, the, the .NET Core moniker was, was to, to, so that we had .NET Framework and .NET Core. And now what, I think what we're kind of settling is it sounds like, hey, the next version of .NET Core is .NET 5. It has Blazor, it has Razor Pages, it has MVC, it has all the things that you've built, it has the things, the, the C Sharp 8 features. So it's not that, that is a, it, there isn't a break between .NET Core and .NET 5. There's no gulf to jump over. Yes, it's a move forward, but it is, but it is, you could almost, if you're really quiet and don't say it too loud, <laughs> it's like it's .NET Core 4. But we don't say that because we already have a .NET 4 and we're trying not to confuse everybody. I say we like the .NET community. I, have, I obviously have nothing to do with any of this naming at all, <laughs> you know, because I don't, I don't work for Microsoft or anything like that. But that's the way that I've thought of it. And so things like .NET Standard helped us bring the APIs together to, have, to know that these are the common APIs that will be in these many versions of .NETs, whether it's Mono or .NET Core or .NET Framework. And we're slowly but surely getting to the place where there's just going to be .NET. Yep, that's correct. And yeah. uh, this is the diagram again, if you see them on my screen, uh, from yeah. the initial introduction for .NET 5. Uh, it explained how after .NET Core 3.1, uh, the next version would be uh, 5.0, which is coming in very soon uh, in November. Right, right. So it isn't a... Already, like, I know. <laughs> it seems like this came together quickly. I, I don't know. I, you know, I'm not on the team. They might say, you know, differently that it was a long process, but I feel like we were just hearing about it and like, wow, here we are. It's November. You know, November's around the corner, and we're gonna have .NET five. I, I think it's an exciting release. I think this also answered the question in the chat. It uh, literally says we're skipping the version four. It would confuse users that are familiar with the .NET framework which has been using the 4.x series for a long time. So we've been through 4.7, 4, 4 4.8, all these recent .NET framework versions, so it wouldn't make sense to take core to version four. Uh, unfortunately, there's always you know, some confusion here and there. I'm happy to explain it. Uh, hopefully going forward, it'll be easier, but uh, for the time being, uh, there is something that is 4.x, which is the full .NET framework that's on Windows. And again, I call, I've been calling it the full .NET framework, but .NET core is pretty complete. Uh, it's been oh, yeah. feature complete for a while. Uh, ever since they added uh, uh, a lot of the features that were missing originally. Uh, I think around the time when they were adding SignalR, I felt it was very complete. Uh, so yeah, that's what it says here is that .NET 5 is the future of the .NET platform, which hopefully answers the question earlier. Right, right. So yeah, there's another yeah. good question in the chat, Chris. Did you see that one from uh, Contrived X? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, Contrived X says upgrading ASP.NET Core 2.2 to 3.1 was actually kind of painful. Would you really recommend updating apps to 5 where it is not LTS? I think that's a great question. I think that would, again, depend on your scenario. Uh, so whatever experience you've had with the past upgrades, uh, hopefully uh, you've uh, communicated some of that feedback uh, with the .NET team. Uh, they're very active in social media as well. Uh, if you reach out to uh, me directly on Twitter, I'm Shahed C, which is S-H-A-H-E-D-C. I can provide your feedback again to the team if you're not uh, able to get that feedback directly to them. Uh, hopefully, uh, getting feedback from developers as you're migrating will help us continue to make those products uh, better with those migrations. So again, I can't speak to what your future experience might be, uh, but we can continue to take in that feedback. Uh, I'm not on the .NET team in any way, uh, but I can pass on feedback to them uh, if you don't wish to do so directly. Yeah. So as somebody who's you know not on any of the teams, I I think the only way you can look at this is that if you take a, a, the GA versions that you see listed here, then you're making a bargain that you will move along to an LTS when it's released. Um, if you take an LTS, then you don't have to live up to that bargain you know as quickly. But uh, I think we're going to see, I think it's fair to say that the days of a 10-year support cycle as we had for .NET Frameworks aren't coming back. Um, 
.NET Core 3.1 LTS doesn't, as far as I know, just off the top of my head, doesn't have an end of life date. And I think, but I think they guaranteed a minimum three years. And I, I have not yet heard any guarantees for .NET 6, 8, the even numbered releases that are going to be LTS. Uh, if it has been said, I just don't recall it. And, and maybe we'll hear it over the next year as we head towards .NET 6. Um, so keeping up is not going to be something where, it, even if you took a .NET Core 3.1, which is LTS, it, I, I think 10 years from now, it will have probably gone out of support. It's, it's just, I think the world we live, you look at what's happening with all the frameworks, it's just not sustainable to, to, uh, to keep something in support that long, so... Yeah, so I think the best thing to do is you know to check out the dev blog. So again, this uh, I'll zoom in on this URL right here. It's devblogs.microsoft.com, specifically slash .dot net, uh, and they have new posts here all the time. And then you'll notice that in this intro post, they did mention uh, questions like uh, future versions. Do we still need .dot net standard and so on? These were addressed in uh, newer announcements uh, this year as well. So again, uh, there are people are listening and they're uh, sharing the, uh, their uh, progress. Uh, has to make progress. Yeah, so don't forget, I think Shahid makes a great point. You can reach out to him. He will definitely get in touch with the team for you. Um, you can also, you know, even the people who write these posts, don't hesitate to reach out to them. They converse directly on Twitter with folks that say, hey, I'm having a problem with with uh, with X, Y, Z. A lot of times they'll see the post on, on Twitter and kind of dive into the thread and say, hold on, tell me more about that. Yep, and uh, if you didn't catch my uh, name earlier, my Twitter handle, uh, it's simply my first name and my last initial, at Shahid C. Uh, should be pretty easy to find. So we got this other food for thought question here. Is it a good time to learn about microservices architecture? Seems like most of the companies are moving to microservices architecture. Uh, wow, that's a loaded. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do we have? Yeah. I don't have a watch, so I, I don't know. Uh, no, I think the answer to that is that if you feel like that's something that you would need at your workplace or something you just wanted to explore, uh, I would suggest like at least uh, watching some videos, reading some books. Based on some of the Microsoft Press books that were out, there there was a .NET Core book specifically around microservices. And uh, uh, some recent videos in the .NET community stand up have focused on, again, microservices. Uh, so, uh, or maybe that was at the build conference, but if you search YouTube, all of Microsoft's official content are on YouTube as well. So uh, read a book and then read the official books, uh, look, watch the official videos, and uh, that way you can at least be knowledgeable if you have to use it for your work project, because then there's nowhere around it. Uh, if you don't have a particular work project that you need it for right now and you're just curious, uh, it doesn't help to just look at the content, to be familiar with it, to figure out whether you need it for a side project for learning, or you might need it for a future project. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, I, you know, I really like the way you uh, explain that. We get a lot of questions on the show often about should I use this pattern or should I use this framework or should I, you know, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we can never say yes, you should or no, you shouldn't, right? But what you're saying is. You know, watch, the, read the blogs, but you know, read some blogs about it. Take a, you know, watch a video about it. Have all these things in the back of your mind, right? These build up your toolkit, so that when you do need it, you're ready to go with it. And I, yep. I like that. Yeah. So you know, we've had a jam-packed hour of content. We haven't even gotten a chance to acknowledge that some folks. We've had a lot of folks here watching in the in the chat live here right on Twitch. And as always, we want to thank you for being with us, for joining in on chat, asking your questions. But even if you're not doing that, just thank you for being here. Uh, we just appreciate that you, that you, we did have somebody answer our question about how did you find out about the show and said, hey, I, I heard about you on Twitter. So that's great. We love hearing that feedback. So go ahead and hit the follow button. And then that way you'll always be notified when we go live, which is uh, normally Wednesdays, 8.30 p.m. U.S. Eastern time. And we're coming up uh, in about another month on a U.S. time shift, so yeah. that'll that'll move when we are around the world in UTC. But uh, where it's going to be eight, it'll be eight thirty p.m. U.S. Eastern time. Now, if you are watching us in the future, that means you're watching us in YouTube, 
And that's every every show is archived. The replays are at video.thedevtalkshow.com. And if you're watching us that way, then you know, please go down and hit the red subscribe button so that you'll know when, when we have a new video. And if you liked this topic, hitting the like button tells us that you want to see more topics like this, that you want to have Shahed back on the show, which I mean, look at the content, like <laughs> there's so much great content here. And then uh, and, and if even if you hit the dislike button, it, it lets us understand, hey, this is the way I want you to go. And here's maybe what I don't want to focus on. But, you know, Shahed, I love how you think about community content. I've always been I know I told you this when we talked is besides just the um, the incredible amount of expertise you bring to a topic, which a lot of a lot of uh, presenters do, a lot of speakers do, you know, you think more than just, okay, here's a bunch of content. I hope you enjoyed it. You usually have multiple ways for people to experience it, whether as a coder or a reader. And I can tell you're always forward thinking about people who come across this and never get to hear your voice. And, and and we'll still be able to take advantage of it. And I see those layers here in NetLearner from the GitHub repo to the blogs. It's it's always so impressive how you. much you think about that. And I, you're one of my favorite community contributors. All right. Um, and the, to, to top it all off, besides being one of the best experts, always, always one of the most humble. It's just such an amazing trait. So... To that end, we had a couple great comments. I can see a lot of hard work behind the blog post. Really, thanks for all your efforts. And uh, another another one, so many nifty things on his blog. And I agree. Absolutely. So I don't want to miss out on anything else you wanted to show us, Shahed. So if I'm rushing, uh, or I mean, I know we could spend hours going through every blog post, but we had your blog and C-Sharp 9, .NET 5, NetLearner. All right, let's see uh, if I covered everything. Uh, and I didn't want to keep it too boring with PowerPoint, but uh, I want to go through this to see uh, if we would covered everything. So just to recap, I wanted to talk about my A to Z blog series, the eBay compilation, NetLearner web app. I feel like we've covered all of that at length. And coming soon, I wanted to share what I wanted to do with .NET 5. Uh, some surprises coming up soon. A new ebook, so again, a recompilation of the same thing. Uh, but using those top-level programs we saw with C Sharp 9, and uh, wanted to build a cinematic universe visualizer. Oh, right. uh, and uh, interesting. if I go through each of those things that we talked about, uh, before I jump to that cinematic universe visualizer, I wanted to show what people are coming to the site for, what are topics are interesting. Like I could be blogging forever and no one reads the content. It's not very useful. So I've posted this top 10 list of uh, what people are visiting uh, as far as the new series is concerned. Uh, they're still visiting some of the old content as well, I guess it shows up in uh, web searches. Uh, but I noticed that uh, authentication seems to come up, I guess people start with the first in the series. Uh, the homepage itself, uh, it's always updated, so every week they would see new content. Uh, so they would go to the homepage or the archives. Uh, and then the devlog series is the index page we've seen. Uh, those come up a lot. But aside from that, there's a logging page. So uh, people are writing their code, maybe they've done some other tutorials, they're trying to figure out, well, now that it's in production, how do I do logging? Uh, things that are new, the generic host builder, that's new in 3.1. Uh, handling errors and IS hosting, so again, something that is maybe not covered enough or they have questions on. And of course, deploying uh, ASP.NET to Azure. So if you want to deploy it to something uh, out in the cloud, uh, you want to know how to do it. So cover that step-by-step -step everywhere. And interestingly enough, the last two here, number nine, number 10, most popular, uh, Blazor Full Stack Web Dev. That's something that's very new to a lot of people. Uh, it changed a little bit last year uh, into this year, so I covered all those differences. Uh, but also looking to the future of .NET 5, C Sharp 9, again, uh, exciting and hopefully interesting to a lot of, a lot of people. Uh, so uh, these are the top posts for 2020. So going forward, uh, we covered the ebook, uh, we covered NetLearner, and then uh, fun with C Sharp. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do next year was to focus on different C Sharp topics. Now notice here, I didn't say C Sharp 8 or C Sharp 9. Uh, I do want to cover a lot of interesting topics that is new in C Sharp 9, but also make sure that I don't leave out recent features. Because just because it came on C Sharp 8 doesn't mean that uh, you've used all of it, right? Because C Sharp 9 includes everything that came before it. Uh, so what I want to do as I'm working towards a new series, a new ebook, uh, stay tuned to wakeupandcode.com to see what the new topics will be. 
Uh, it'll be a different kind of A to, D, a to Z series. It won't be a rehash of what I've done before. Uh, and in parallel to that, I want to do my Cinematic Universe Visualizer. Uh, I did want to start out with the MCU because Marvel Cinematic Universe happens to have a lot more movies than the other cinematic universes. But uh, I realized that it may not be everyone's cup of tea. Uh, so I wanted to make sure I have this generic web app that can cover anything. Uh, and you might be wondering, well, what, what will I do with this? Um, do, am I going to need a HoloLens? What, what, what are you showing on the screen? Um, th there'll be more information coming soon, uh, hopefully by the end of the year and then into next year. Uh, but the point of the Universe Visualizer is to have a web-based uh, uh, basic application first to enter in information, uh, which I will have all the sample data loaded into the app so you can use it as an end user. But you can use it to load your own data to visualize your own uh, you know, cinematic universe. Uh, it would answer questions like, in case you're wondering, uh, in which movie did the Iron Man first meet Captain America? Uh, or how many times has Captain America appeared in the MCU? Uh, you would have breakdowns of different movies, the scenes, post credit scenes, and so on. And again, the web can get a little boring if you're just pointing and clicking. Uh, so I want to also introduce things like real-time features with SignalR uh, that can have automatic trivia uh, games. So let's say if all the data is already in there, uh, to be able to not only display trivia, but uh, create a, a trivia games where you can have an interactive experience on your site. Uh, and then all of this will be open source from the get-go. And uh, I uh, do want to make some sort of HoloLens experience. Uh, again, I'm teasing you with this little Iron Man screen here. Uh, so that maybe that can be sort of a lighthouse sort of feature uh, where the same experience can be uh, visualized uh, in a 3D holographic world around you. A good use case for building a bot around uh, all of that information as well. Totally, yes. Uh, so yeah. I do have uh, some initial uh, designs done. Uh, one of the uh, things that the bots would do is, again, you would ask the bot those questions, right? Uh, yeah. There are some uh, new features that just got announced this week. Uh, some of the services that is provided through Azure, uh, including texting services as well, now uh, will be first party uh, from Azure services. So again, instead of using a third party service to be able to expose a bot's questions and answers uh, from SMS uh, services. You could just pull out your phone and ask the bot, like uh, maybe you, you just want to know uh, how many Thor movies are there, which one really sucks, or something like yeah. that, right? And yeah. be able to give you that information, or uh, you know, even like uh, things beyond. Uh, let's say you want to know, like uh, uh, you, you want to know when one uh, a performer, uh, cast member on a show has been uh, in other movies with the same cast member. So sometimes. So there's so many people in the Marvel Universe and all these movies and shows, uh, you'll see the same people appearing uh, with the same cast members in other movies too. Uh, so maybe you want to know like where else have they appeared together? Uh, who else have they performed with and so on? Uh, so which as, as the, Exactly, right? So oh. I'll, I will be like experimenting with different database scenarios. Uh, I personally have been using SQL Server for a long time. I know people say, well, you should use Cosmos DB uh, for stuff like this. So I'll, I'll be experimenting with that as well. Again, it will be open source, so I'll be taking uh, feedback uh, from people out there as well. You know, I'm just throwing this out here. Maybe this is not what I should do as a host, like putting you on the spot. But I'm thinking about the demos that they did. Um, it was it was demos around machine learning stuff and a lot of the, um, uh, uh, what do you call them, um, the services that uh, that provide, you know, speech recognition and, and, and text oh, recognition, cognitive, uh, cognitive services yeah. and things like that. Yep. And they did a demo about um, about uh, the shooting of JFK. And I don't, I don't, you've probably seen those demos over the years. I remember where, that. Yeah, there was the JFK yeah, files. Yeah, yeah. And they pulled all the data in there and you could go and you could query the data using you know certain techniques. Uh, and it would show you relationships between different individuals in the whole thing, right? And it was basically doing it by reading all these just text documents. And I wonder, you could probably do something interesting like that with the cinematic universe because there's, you know, you could probably find lots of articles and stories and, and just suck all that data in and let machine learning, like, do some cool stuff. You know, that, that is definitely very cool. I've, I've uh, not only uh, seen that before, I've used it uh, as a springboard for some customer projects as well. Uh, that was a very, uh, a very useful demo. It was cool. Yeah. 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 I love that idea of the, the cast members that have been in other projects together. You know, when I was younger, we used to call that six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Yes. But, uh, exactly. And th that's the whole purpose, cool. right? Uh, that's when, awesome. now, I remember long uh, before I discovered IMDb, 
Uh, again, I, for those of you who don't know, I was uh, born and raised in Bangladesh. I didn't have a computer even in high school. Uh, so I created my own IMDB, not knowing what IMDB was, uh, by like just drawing uh, uh, these different squares on pieces of, large pieces of paper that I taped together. So I had a super giant poster with lots of large pieces of paper taped together with uh, different uh, movie names, uh, performer names. And it was completely, uh, a, a, is it denormalized, normalized, where you have duplicated data all over the place? So it wasn't very, uh, you know, very good database, but it was uh, essentially uh, some sort of like document DB that I'd done on a piece of paper with pen and paper. And uh, I think like this is uh, so, sort of like a childhood uh, like visualization that I'm bringing to life with this new project next year. And hopefully you know, I'll be able to share that with the world and it will cover uh, a lot. In fact, you know what, what while I'm here, uh, I uh, started off with an early version of the project a couple of years ago. I never uh, built it, but uh, it's called Rivet. And again, Rivet itself is an acronym because, you know, I like patterns and acronyms and all. all. Uh, so Rivet stands for Related Info Viewer uh, with Extra Things, because again, it sounds <laughs> like a Rivet, right? And again, <laughs> oh, the yeah. original design was this. And you asked about bots, right? So yeah. uh, there's your web ser web app service, right? Uh, with uh, ASP.NET Core uh, split up in the web browser. And you'll notice I have the mobile app as well. The way I wanted to do the mobile app was that let's say you go into a movie theater, uh, which is, I guess, empty now, but if you go up to a movie theater and look at a poster and point it to a movie poster of Black Widow, which is delayed again, right, to 2021, uh, but uh, if you put point at the movie poster, it'll automatically detect who it is, what poster it is, and then uh, give you more info from uh, the cinematic visualizer. And then the HoloLens stuff will be able to you know, interact with these different things, drill down, uh, and then the bot service will be uh, able to answer your questions, all these questions you may have. Uh, and again, I wrote SQL database here in Cosmos DB question mark. So again, I guess I'm uh, still on the fence of what I want to use. And I also want to use Azure functions. So again, if you want like quick things that just run in the cloud and just get data and dump it in your database, I figured Azure functions is a great way to use it. Uh, serverless uh, code, it just sits out there. Uh, again, I learned C Sharp and .NET for it. Uh, I've done it for uh, personal projects and also for customer projects. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, external APIs I would be using, but initial data would be all just me inputting the data because there's a very finite amount of data that goes into these uh, movies. Uh, there's, I think, 23 movies right now in the Marvel MCU universe, but I'll be adding other, uh, under other movies as well outside of the original MCU and the new movies that are coming out soon. Uh, so it's just a matter of time it'll take for me to add all of that stuff. Uh, but again, Let's say I want to see what else an actor has been in or an actress has been in. Uh, I could use some IMDb or other movie API to get that cross reference data as well. Wow. Cool. Yeah, yeah, this is really this is a really old design, but uh, I'll see it says two years ago. I never did anything yeah. with it. Uh, but uh, as you can see, I wanted to use a, a business scenario as well, uh, not just for like movies, but for visualizing team members in an organization to find out who works with who. But again, I don't think this is needed. Uh, some of the features that we've had with Exchange and Teams uh, since in the past couple of years has been uh, very advanced right now. Uh, the, even, if, even if you want to know what technology someone has worked with, you can go to Teams, add that uh, extra app on the side, and you can ask Teams, uh, who knows Power BI? And you get a list of people who have been uh, mentioning Power BI in their communications uh, within your organization. Uh, so again, uh, this part's not needed, but what I'll be focusing on as a side project uh, is to use security entertainment application and uh, instead of 2.1 it'll be obviously five but again really old project that i uh, thought of uh, many years ago but finally we'll make some time to visualize it next year hopefully yeah pretty cool another reference it sounds like to me because now instead of just asp.net core we're going to have some reference code for serverless and and, and bots and at least you know i'm not going to put you on the spot because there's a lot of work for you to do but i can't wait to see this come to life yeah, and uh, that's another reason blog. why I wanted to separate uh, the blog series versus uh, the C Sharp uh, or the, this project itself. So what I'd like to do is that the blog series will focus on new .NET 5 and C Sharp 9 stuff. Again, a lot of new uh, content coming out there. I'd like to, I'd love to get new folks who have never used .NET and C Sharp. Maybe they've been turned off by uh, the language itself. Maybe some negative experiences they've had in the community, whether online or in person. Uh, maybe they find language to be not very friendly or fun. Uh, so the block series, uh, the aim of that will be 
uh, to help uh, uh, new or veteran developers uh, learn new features and also new developers learn the language itself. And in parallel, uh, I, I want to work on this product where I'm able to uh, build it over time. Uh, and uh, the write-ups for this might be in the form of uh, GitHub pages, uh, but it, again, it'll be a separate beast from the blog series, which will focus on .NET 5 and C Sharp 9 for both new and veteran developers. All right, well, there's always a lot of great content uh, from Shahed, and there's more coming. So as far as uh, us here on the Dev Talk Show, don't forget you can follow us on Twitter at The Dev Talk Show. And uh, these replays are all on YouTube, video.thedevtalkshow.com. So, you know, first of all, I just have to thank you, Shahed, for coming on and sharing so much in just a little over an hour. That was four episodes worth, wouldn't you say, Rich and Andy? Yeah, uh, I was going to give Rich a chance to jump in, but I don't know if he's going to start. So, uh, yeah, you know, um, it's just that he's got so much content, right? And he's been doing this content for, you know, a couple of years. And I just want to say as a community member, thanks for all the work that you've been doing that, you know, you've been putting out there for all of us. To, uh, to consume and to learn with you. And uh, it's been enjoyable and, and we appreciate it all. Thank yeah. you. So don't forget, um, Shahed wants you to wake up and code. So go to wakeupandcode.com. You can check out the 2018 series, the 2019 series, the 2020 series. Uh, don't forget to go check out NetLearner. There's a great reference architecture there with three, all three ASP.NET Core front end frameworks there to choose from and you know if you just follow Shahed on Twitter you're going to see all these announcements the cinematic universe browser everything that he does going forward you know just like I said I was thrilled that you joined us on the show and I I hope that we'll have you again real soon so yeah I do have one word of advice uh if you're uh if you create a user to do a demo do not forget the password for that demo <laughs> That's right. But you know, one of the things that we love about this show is, is because it's live, it just shows that we're all human. And I like that for a lot of the folks who come here and tell us I'm new to development, I'm new to coding, and, and people can get so intimidated. And we don't want you to be intimidated. Like we just, we're just like you. Um, we've just maybe just a little longer. And so we might remember a few things, but how much do we look up every day to keep doing our jobs? So... That's it, I think. So, hey, thanks to everybody who joined us in the chat. Really appreciate it. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you hit that like button and and, and we'll catch you again next time. So I want to once again say thank you to uh, I'm a special guest, Shahed Shaduri, and uh, and for my co-host, Andy Schwam. And, and he was here making it sound great, look great. Uh, Rich Ross, thank you for everything you did to make this show go. Uh, we hope to see you all back next week, 8.30 p.m. U.S. Eastern time for the Dev Talk Show.